Dragon Age 2 was rated M for Mature by the ESRB and contains blood and gore, language, sexual content, and violence. Viewer discretion is advised. Hello everyone, my name is Emma Ronith and I play games for the internet and today we're playing Dragon Age 2. Uh, I have actually paused in the middle of episode 44 to record this uh, because we've completed all of the missions in game except for the final one. And before we begin that, I wanted to read off all of the codex entries. And, um, yeah, starting with Orvar's prize. Orvar Reed, Raid was a gifted young smith of Orzammar. He fell in love in secret with the youngest daughter of Waldor Turin, a high-ranking warrior, but Orvar knew the, their union would never earn Walder's blessing. He worked hard at his craft and fashioned a beautiful mace, wrought from the purest steel enchanted with lyrium. He presented it to his love's father, who immediately recognized its value. Walder Turin asked what Arvar desired in re exchange for the weapon, and Arvar replied, This is a masterwork piece. It is worth more to me than my own life. As payment, I can only accept something that is as dear to you as this mace is to me. Walder was silent for a moment, and then burst out laughing, amused at Orver's, Orver's boldness. He agreed to the, a price that he believed was worthy of the mace. Not two days later, Orver and his love stole away from the city with the princely sum her father had provided. Incensed, Walder tore Arzamar apart, looking for his daughter, but she had gone with Orvar to the surface to start a new life. He never saw them again. The mace remained in Orzammar, but Walder could not bear to look upon it. It was hidden away deep in his estate, and sold to a merchant upon his death. Bianca. Varric's crossbow is a marvel of dwarven craftsmanship, clearly the work of a master. However, she bears no smith's mark. When asked how he procured a weapon, pr procured the weapon, Varric has a few claims. He could have won it at a game of Wicked Grace against Paragon Branca. It could have been a gift from a mysterious old beggar who disappeared into thin air, and it's possible he bought it of a crooked merchant in Lowtown with the previous owner's hand still wrapped around the trigger. None of those explanations is very likely, and continued questioning simply results in Varric grinning and walking away. Bloom Our hero strode the winding road, defiant of the vile, uncertain pause for home and cause when met with the when met the monster smile a man his kin through blood and sin a bastard of the gloom a rising cut through bone and gut an awful skyward an awful skyward bloom from songs of the old of old marches the death of goodman sir austis at the hand of the reverse shias inscriptions collected by philium a bard <clears throat> the celebrant the Grand Tourney is the oldest and perhaps only tradition of the Free Marches. On those rare one-in-a-thousand days when a contest of arms may be called, every marcher unites in fellowship to witness the birth of a new champion. Contestants come from all over Thetis. Menrathus alone always sends no fewer than two dozen entrants hoping to claim the honor for the Imperium. Once the champion was an Avar mountain man. Twice in a row it was Talisa of Sundrain of Sundarin, a lady knight from the Anderfells, which scandalized the crowd and created endless drama amongst the participants, and therefore got her declared the most loved champion in the history of the tourney. Each champion is presented a crown of sage leaves and a sword. The leaves wither, of course, as a, remind, a, remind, bleh, as a reminder that all victories are fleeting, but the blade, Celebrant, endures and has passed from champion to champion since the first, inscribed with the names of each victor. A reminder that it legend is eternal. From In Pursuit of Knowledge, The Travels of a Chantry Scholar by Brother Jenna TV. The Centurion's Quirus. In the 435th year of the Tevinter Imperium, Archon Alamdrus built a summer palace for himself near the eyes of Nocan. Nosen. 
Nakin sounds right to me, but I'm pretty sure it's Nosen. The palace was considered one of the greatest wonders of the world, and many of Alamdras' ri jealous rivals hatched plots to burn it to the ground. To protect his palace, the Archon stationed 100 soldiers on permanent guard. These centurions were sworn only to the service of the Archon himself, their oaths sealed with blood. The reign of Almadras... Alam... 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 Al 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 why can my mouth not form this word? Almadris. Almadrius. Almadrius. There we go. Ended in violence and his successor, Tidarian, co converted the palace into a garrison for his troops, fighting the insurrections all over the Imperium. Amidst the bedlam, the centurions maintained their watch. Their watch. They eventually fell in battle. But their oaths held, and the bodies rose again to take their posts. When Tidarian's reign came to an end, the magisters fought amongst themselves for twenty vicious years before they crowned a new archon. And when Parthenius finally took the throne, he found that the palace and its guardians had vanished. Not a single stone remained of the Nasen countryside. Some say the centurions, faithful to their oaths, carried the palace away brick by brick and rebuilt it in a distant land where it would be safe, waiting for an archon to lay claim to it. From Impossible Tales of the Imperium by Hendrik of Cumberland. God, that one was so hard to read. I am so sorry, everyone. <clears throat> Finesse. Some might find it strange that the greatest assassin in the history of the Antiban Crows was both a woman and a commoner. A whore, if the legend is to be believed. I conferred with several crows myself, all of them whom spoke only with mon monetary incentive as well as assurances of anonymity. 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 There we go. God! And they say it is true. The assassin to known to legend as Finesse was Callisto de Bastion, a wealthy courtesan who was welcome in many noble homes as well as their bedrooms. She was gifted with a silver tongue and, according to many contacts, may have received training among the Orlesian bards in addition to her time with the crows. Perhaps this is where her success can be credited? Finesse achieved fame and adoration among the common folk with the fatal stabbing of King Guillemar the Younger in 422 Black. This adoration is not necessarily shared by the crows, however. That she was captured, hanged, and her fabled dagger auctioned off to the highest bidder speaks poorly of her skills. Still, in centuries since, the crows have embraced her legend as their own, convenient as it only adds to their dangerous reputation. From A Shadow Unfolds by Brother Ansel of Hosberg, 710 Storm. Girdle of the Elders The elf seemed pretty upset when we started pawing at his stuff, especially the belt, Turns out it's some kind of heirloom. The knife ear claimed it came from Arlathan and that it had been in his family for generations. Well, things change. We dumped the body by the mine for the clan to find. I took a closer look at the belt and it was clear the leather was new, but there was something odd about the buckle. So I brought it to this fellow in Valroyo who deals in antiques and he tells me it's old. Could even be from the time of the ancient elves. Suppose the runt was telling the truth. Anyway, so hope this is adequate payment for the job. You could sell it or melt the buckle down. I believe it's real silverite. Excerpt from a letter found in a gambling den in Jader. Glandavalis. It is heresy today to speak of Chartan, an elven slave that rose up against his Deventer masters to help Andraste's barbarian invasion. It seems most people would prefer to believe that Andraste crossed the waking sea with little more than a basket of flowers and songs of peace and harmony. The truth is that she came with a horde of warriors at her back, and that without a rebellion occurring behind the enemy lines, it's very possible that the holy invasion could have been foiled. Shartan was a slave who became a fabled warrior and later a devotee of Andraste herself, and we know this because the Canticle of Shartan spoke of their meeting on the Valerian fields. Andraste gave him a mystic blade he that he called Glandivalis, translation unknown, and he even fought at Mafrath's side. 
but now the canticle is one of the dissonant verses, and has been ever since, since the exalted march of the Dales. It seems we don't wish to speak of elven heroes or the role they played in Andraste's war, any more than we wish to speak of barbarians or the bloody death toll that accompanied the war. With each passing age, heroes like Shartan become more of a fable, but some of us will always know the truth. From the Dissonant Verses by Sister Petrine, Chantry Scholar, 925 Dragon. Longbow of the Jackal there once was a bard from Mont Zamad whose tongue was made of the pure, of purest silver. His name was Corsad the Jackal, and he was famous for enchanting emperors and empresses by knowing exactly what to say to please them. This often got Corsa into trouble. One day Corsa was travelling to Val Royal, where he was to press his silver tongued words into the Empress Necessity. Who says, ear, <coughs> uh, mm. Nessie, Empress Nessie, that's her name now. As he walked and rehearsed, a mighty storm blew in. Rain washed away the path and Corsa became hopelessly lost. Chill set into his bones and so he took shelter in a cave. But the cave was home to a big brown bear. Corsa drew his longbow and but the bear seized it. I was just about to go out for dinner, said the bear. Nice of you to drop by. He looked at Corsa and began to drool. You shouldn't do that, replied Corsa. I am old and stringy and not at all good to eat. Let me share your cave and in the morning I will gather honey and berries. You shall have a feast fit for kings. Agreed, said the bear. But go no further into the cave. You won't like what you'll find there. Corsa warmed himself by nestling into the bear's thick fur. The bear fell asleep, but Corsa was kept awake by what lay further in the darkness. Finally, he could no longer endure the mystery. At the back of the cave, Corsa found a huge room, and in the middle of that room, an enormous dragon! Mmm, said the dragon. Food. Wait, wait, cried Corsa. I am old and stringy, and not at all good to eat. Let me leave, and I will bring you the bear. I think not, said the dragon. That bear promised me breakfast. And that was the end of the jackal. The Tale of Corsa, from Bedtime Stories for Good Children, by Sister Marigold. <laughs> the bear had a point. <laughs> How cute. Vestments of Sacrifice the Vestments of Sacrifice is a replica of the robe worn by Grey Warden Neria, a mage who fought in the Second Blight's final battle at, in Starkhaven. According to legend, she threw herself in front of a Darkspawn emissary to protect her lover, Corin. Neria's sacrifice saved Corin's life, which was instrumental in ending the Blight, for it was Corin's blade that struck the archdemon Zazakel down. The original robe was displayed at, a cir at the Circle of Magi in Antiva for many years, and I count myself among the um, I count myself among the lucky to have seen Nerea's robe before it was destroyed in a fire. I constructed this replica from my notes and sketches, and it is as ac accurate a copy as one could achieve. I have even gone to great lengths to recreate the enchantments placed on the original robes. The recreation of this garment brings me great joy and fulfillment. I hope it brings the same to one of your order. Please accept this gift, humbly presented as a token of appreciation for all the Grey Wardens have done for Thetis. Excerpt of a letter from First Enchanter Haramund of Starkhaven to the Warden Commander Den Dernheim of Weishaupt. That is all for items. Places, of course, done. Lore. <clears throat> History of the Chantry, Chapter 4. The crowds present at the death of Andraste were right to feel despair. It is believed that the prophet's execution angered the Maker, and he turned his back on humanity once more, leaving the people of Thetis to suffer in the dark. In these dark times, mankind scrambled for a light, any light. Some found comfort in demonic cults that promised power and riches in return for worship. Others prayed to the old gods for forgiveness, begging the dra great dragons to return to the world. Still others fell so, so low as to worship the Darkspawn, 
forming vile cults dedicated to the, to the exaltation of evil in its purest form. It is said that the world wept as its people begged for a savior who would not come. Andraste's followers, however, did not abandon her teachings when she died. The cult of Andraste rescued her sacred ashes from the courtyard in Manrathus after her execution, stealing them away to a secret temple. The location of that temple has long been lost, but the ashes of Andraste served as a symbol of the enduring nature of the faith in the Maker. That humanity could earn the Maker's forgiveness despite its grievous insult to him. With time, the cult of Andra Andraste spread and grew, and the chant of light took form. Sing this chant in the four corners of Thetis, it was said, and the world would gain the Maker's attention at last. As the chant of light spread, the cult of Andraste became known as the Andrastean Chantry. Those who converted to the Chantry's belief found it in their mission to spread Andraste's word. There were many converts, including powerful people in the Imperium and in the city-states of what is now Orle. Such was the power of the Maker's word that the young King Dracon undertook a series of exalted marches meant to unite the city-states and create an empire solely dedicated to the Maker's will. The Orlesian Empire became the seat of the Chantry's power, the Grand Cathedral in Val Royale, the source of the movement that birthed the organization, bleh, the organized Chantry we, as we know it today. Dracon, by then Emperor Dracon I, created the Circle of Magi, the Order of Templars, and the Holy Office of the Divine. Many with the, within the Chantry revere him nearly as equal as that. Nearly as equal with Andraste herself. God, I'm so sorry. I can't believe I'm having such a hard time reading. The modern Chantry is a thing of faith and beauty, but it is also a house of necessity, protecting Thetis from powerful forces that would do it harm. Where the Grey Wardens protect the world from the Blights, the Chantry protects mankind from itself. Most of all, the Chantry works to earn the Maker's forgiveness, so that one day he will return and transform the world into the paradise it was always meant to be. From Tales of the Destruction of Thetis by Brother Dana TV, Chantry Scholar. The Enigma of Kirkwall. Ancient of lore is hard to come by, but there is history to be had here in Kirkwall, the city once home to the Imperium slave trade. What answers does Kirkwall hold? Why look here instead of Preventium? Uh, Paravantium, or Valdorma? The Imperium does not give up its secrets easily. Even with the Magister's centuries dead, our journey is perilous. Here on the docks of the gallows we renew our vows. And should we fail, search for the markings of the Band of Three. A tattered letter found under a cobblestone. It has curious markings and is signed the Band of Three. The Viscount is suspicious, but the bribe was sufficient to gain access to the restricted section of the archives. The money would have been better spent elsewhere, the archives being almost devoid of Imperium-era records. When the slaves revolted, they hunted magisters and burned the city, at least the parts that could be burned. One account says that the streets were littered with piles of scrolls and books set aflame. Is our quest futile? Did the slaves destroy the answer? As Mafrath's armies toppled the Imperium, they sent three magisters and their legions here. They never arrived, but why march here of all places? What were they coming here for? behind a panel with curious markings, signed the Band of Three. It is as we saw, as we thought. The quarries in, of Kirkwall were found after the city was sacked by the Imperium, and after they started constructing the city. The Imperium found the wealth, bleh, found the mineral wealth, not the indigenous people. The histories give conflicting accounts on who lived here before the Imperium. Some say it was the Alamari, some say the Deidfids, we know that it was a barbarian people who had little need of the metals in the hills. So why did the Imperium come here with, in such force? It is hard to disprove Brother Mikkel's theory that the natural harbor would be important for their armies, but magisters ruled, not common men. What barrier would a simple sea pose to them? The wars with the Alamari wouldn't start until centuries later. Each clue we find only leads to more questions, but we will not give up. Underneath a pile of small boulders carved with a curious marking, carved with curious markings and signed the Band of Three. In the back alleys of Low Town, you can find extraordinary things. Priceless tomes of knowledge can be bought with a handful of gold. The Chant of Archon Levias, 
a whole chapter of the Midnight Compendium. Some of these books were thought lost forever. And these are no forgeries. I've verified their authenticity myself. The fences have no inkling that what they're selling has value. Where did these books come from? After several failed attempts, I got my answer underneath the city. There is a hive of hidden passages in Kirkwall's sewers. Now and then, a lucky sewer rat comes across an unlooted chamber, and then a cache of ancient Deventer relics spread through the black market. We must search below the city. Underneath the cobblestone, with curious markings faintly glowing, it is signed the Band of Three. A maze of caves, sewers, and hidden passages. We found three Tevinter chambers already looted, but today, tonight, we found one closed. It was a small cell containing a few trinkets and a common tome, but it symbolizes hope. The Magisters had hundreds of mages deep below Kirkwall. They lived and researched here, far from the scrutiny of common men. Many ancient cities specialized in arcane research, but why did Kirkwall hide its efforts here? Why go to such great pains to keep it out of sight? Were they a cabal of renegade magisters, or was this a special project of the Archon? Hidden in a small fissure near curious markings and signed the Band of Three. Ironically, the Chantry is the best records on the Imperium occupation that we found. None of the forbidden texts, which have undoubtedly been destroyed, but many administrative records. In their cold, numbered rows, misery is told. Thousands of slaves pass through the gallows to work the mines or to be shipped elsewhere. The list of elven children is numbing. Three maimed, two mute, and four serviceable. These numbers don't add up. For every thousand slaves that came to Kirkwall, a hundred disappeared. I checked the tax rolls as well, and the discrepancy exists there, too. If one has the wit to see it. 203 slaves went missing in the Imperium's 312th year. That's just one year. Other records showed similar discrepancies. Over centuries, practically a whole civilization of slaves simply disappeared. Hidden inside the cover of a book with curious markings and signed the Band of Three. After pursuing another dead end, we were attacked by Maleficarum. I fear V will not make it. The fences must have tipped them off. Are they cultists trying to protect the answer? Or are they after it themselves? Or was it a random attack? The mages of Kirkwall have more a more troubled history than those of other circles. A greater percentage of them do not survive the harrowing, and a greater percentage turn to blood magic. Almost double that of Starkhaven or Ostwick. Is there a secret fraternity delving into the Tevinter secrets of the city? Either way, we must be more careful, lest we become the band of one or none. Hidden under a cobblestone with curious markings and signed the band of three. Access has not been easy, and I fear my disguise will not bear great scrutiny, but I saw the records the Templars say do not exist. The blood of countless slaves was spilled beneath the city in sacrifice. Whole buildings were built upon lakes of blood. The sewers have grooves where blood would flow, all leading down. The scale is hard to fathom. A blood mage can channel great power from a simple cut. At least a thousand unfortunates die here every year for centuries. For what ungodly purpose would one need so much power? I must retreat now before I am uncovered, but the answer is close. Behind a panel with curious markings and signed the Band of Three. It is well known that the veil is thin in Kirkwall, small wonder given the suffering in the city. But we have discovered the Magisters were deliberately thinning it even further. Beneath the city, demons can contact even normal men. Did they seek the Black City to compound the madness of their previous efforts? Or was it something else? We found a chamber where the veil is at its thinnest, long since looted, but the power is still there. Tonight we will go there. Pray for us. Pray for us all. Behind a rock with curious markings and signed the Band of Three. A recent trove was uncovered. This was, this one was big, perhaps the Archon's visitation chambers, and, the flood, and a flood of tomes is on the market. Even the simple fences know something is amiss. They've raised their prices at the frenzy of collectors. One said he sold a copy of the fell grimoire. I doubt he would lie. How could he know the tome is a mere legend? If that is real, then what of the Forgotten Ones? This journey has taken us to many strange places and made us reevaluate many former truths. Where will it end? Hidden under a cobblestone with curious markings and signed the Band of Three. Dragon's Blood Collecting dragon's blood is extremely difficult even for the most accomplished dragon hunter. First, one must locate the increasingly rare creatures. Second, one must bleed it. 
However, I believe that the moment that at the moment of death the blood loses something special, a certain fiery essence, perhaps. Of course, bleeding a live dragon is quite tricky. Dragon's blood has a wide variety of uses, both magical and culinary. It's an important component of runecrafting, and those like my great-grandfather enjoy a sprinkling of the powdered stuff to their food at the dinner table. From Discovering Dragon's Blood, Potions, Tinctures, and Spicy Sauces by Ferdinand Pentagast. Of course it's a Pentagast. <laughs> we find out more about the Pentagasts later, but uh... Remember that the Seeker that Varric's talking to at the beginning of the game is... Cassandra Pentagast. <sighs> Philandaris. The name Philandaris is elven, meaning demon weed, which is fitting for this rare plant because it grows only in places where the veil is thin. Philandaris is easily identified. It's a twisted, wicked-looking shrub with long, thorny shoots and no leaves, a skeletal hand reaching out from an unmarked grave. Many swear the plant radiates a palpable aura of malevolence. So so it comes to no surprise that it unnerves many a junior herbalist. An excerpt from the Botanical Compendium by Inus Arancia, botanist. The Revolutionists. Each circle of magi is home to various fraternities of enchanters that serve as social outlets for mages and ways for those of like mind to promote their philosophies on magic. The most marginal of these were always the Libertarians, who believed mages must take a more active role in the politics of Thetis. While publicly only advocating greater power for the Circles, many Libertarians secretly wished to split completely from the, chant yeah. from the Chantry, as mages did in Tevinter. The Chantry allowed the group to continue in order to promote bleh, in order to note potential troublemakers. Phew. The Resolutionists changed all that. Splitting from the main libertarian fraternity, the Resolutionists are open apostates who support freedom for mages at all costs. They have engaged in acts of terror and sabotage against the Chantry throughout Thetis, and many are connected to Kirkwall's mage underground. They have declared that unless mages are freed to rule themselves, they will show every person in Thetis how little protection the Circle of Magi actually offers. The Right of Annulment In the 83rd year of the Glory Age, one of the mages of the Navaran Circle was found practicing forbidden magic. The Templars executed him swiftly, but this brewed discontent among the Navara Circle. The mages mounted several magical attacks against the Templars, vengeance for the executed mage, but the Knight Commander was unable to track down which were responsible. Three months later, the mages summoned a demon and turned it loose against their Templar Watchers. Demons, however, are not easily controlled. After killing the first wave of Templars who tried to contain it, the demon took possession of one of its summoners. The resulting abomination slaughtered Templars and mages both before escaping into the countryside. The Grand Cleric sent a legion of Templars to hunt the fugitive. They killed the abomination a year later, but by that time it had slain seventy people. Divine Galatea, responding to the catastrophe in Navarra and hoping to prevent the further incidents, granted all Grand Clerics of the Chantry the power to purge a circle entirely if they rule it irredeemable. This rite of annulment has been performed 17 times in the last 700 years. From Of Fires, Circles, and Templars, A History of Magic in the Chantry, by Sister Patrine, Chantry Scholar. <laughs> Characters Anders, the last three years After his attack on Ella, Anders lost interest in the cause of Maved Revolution. Convinced he was no better than an abomination, Anders was determined to gain mastery over the spirit inside him, or die trying. This is increasingly apparent in that he is losing this struggle. Prone to wild mood swings between deep melancholy and manic determination, Anders has again taken up the mantle of mage freedom, though it is unclear whether this, this decision came from Anders or Justice. Aveline, the last three years. Thanks to the champion's actions, Aveline and Donic Hendrier were married a year ago in a simple ceremony on the Hawk estate. Oh, I 
didn't know they got married in Hawk's house. <clears throat> Sorry. They honeymooned in Orlaid, the only time that Aveline has visited the country of her namesake. The pair has since settled into a happy marriage. Although she remains his captain and he her guardsman, Aveline now strictly divides her personal and private life. She is no less driven to keep her guardsmen safe, but Donick provides another perspective, and she is now giving her guard the authority they need to truly serve Kirkwall. As a force for law and order, the guard has never been more respected. This brings its own challenges, however, as some among the Templars would prefer that the guard be under their direct command. Fenris, the last three years. Three years ago, after confronting Hadriana, Fenris learned of his long-lost sister. He has spoken little of it, though it clearly still preys on his mind. He has not left Kirkwall to pursue the matter, remaining in Daenerys's mansion, even though it is common knowledge in Hightown that a friend of the champion lives within. Fenris finds his high profile in the city both intriguing and alarming. Over the last year, he has spoken more, of once, more than once of leaving Kirkwall for good, if not for the debt that he owes to Garrett, he would likely have already moved on. I think I reversed some words there. Same thing, though. As for the night Fenris and Garrett shared three years ago, he refuses to speak more of it. However, it's clear he has not forgotten, although any lingering feelings remained unresolved. Whether that will chain rem change remains to be seen. Spoiler, it has. It did. <clears throat> Leliana Many stories have been told of Leliana. Some say she fought alongside the hero of Ferelden against the Blight prior to serving at the right hand of the Divine. Even that is heresy. Is hearsay, sorry. The only thing known for certain is that the Bard is often seen at the Divine's side in Val Royale. This has caused no small degree of alarm in the Chantry's inner circles. Does the Divine have a plan of her own? What might Leliana's part be? The truth remains to be seen. Meryl, the last three years. Everything I do, I've ever done. Everything I've ever done was for the good of my people. Meryl spends more and more of her time locked away in her house in the alienage with her mirror. She leaves only to buy food, which she does so rarely that Varric has taken to having produce delivered to her door. At least she no longer gets lost as she wanders the city. Sebastian, the last three years. After his confrontation with the desired demon Allure, Sebastian had a crisis of faith over breaking his priestly vows to pursue worldly power in Starkhaven. He questioned his own motives, worrying that he wanted to retake Starkhaven for his own personal power, not because it was the right thing to do. Trusting Starkhaven's fate to the Maker, he returned to the Chantry, but was turned away by Gland Cleric Althena, who believed he had not yet fully committed that had not yet committed fully to either course. Though he has not renewed his vows or returned to his duties as a brother, Sebastian proved a faithful servant to the Grand Cleric over the past three years. As Kirkwall grows ever more turbulent, the Grand Cleric relies on Sebastian to be her eyes and ears in the often dangerous secular world. Whether he will again devote himself to the Chantry or return to Starkhaven is still anyone's guess. Though Sebastian was heard saying that he will not leave Kirkwall as long as both the Champion and the Grand Cleric need him. Varric, the last three years. There's power in stories. That's all history is, the best tales, the ones that last. Might as well be mine. Varric saw Bartrand settled into a sanitarium just outside Kirkwall, run by the Chantry. He then took up the mantle of House Tethrys official officially. However, according to the updated official Kirkwall and Merchant's Guild documents, the family businesses are run by a non by non-existent uncles, aunts, cousins, and household pets. <laughs> Zevran Aranai. We are in danger, friend. Two of the seven guild masters are already in Zevran Aranai's, po Aranai's pocket, and the guild ma master of Rialto is dead. While no proof exists, we both know he was involved, whether he claims the deed or not. They should have released him when they discovered he lived. Honor of the Antivan Crows be damned. What option do we have now? After centuries of unity that have led us to rule a nation from the shadows and have placed kings and queens in our pockets, we are being torn apart from within by a single elf who didn't even succeed in his mission to kill the so-called Hero of Ferelden. 
The guildmaster has dismissed Zevron's threat without considering just how many assassins were similarly disaffected. Too many of our numbers have been cheated out of their rifle tithes, driven into hiding or intimidated into silence. And somehow, Zevron is finding them all. You report that he is not in Antiva, but isn't that always the case? He appears in a city until our operatives find him and chase him out into Ravain or the Free Marches, and then we never hear from them again. We have both spoken to the remaining guildmasters, and they have denied us. They are blind, and it makes me think that maybe Zevron is right. Perhaps it is time for a change. From a half-burned letter found in a, tre in a Trevisio warehouse, 935 Dragon. Letters and Notes The Origin Scrolls Second Oh, right. Origin Scrolls First Aspect The first scroll is marked with a chastened chieftain sigil sigil. Mine daughter was taken by the caster, and mine legion met him. She was pried from his blood scrolls, but some horror did inhabit him instead. My legion could not contain, and I ask for a seal, whether the faith, whatever the faith, price be paid, scholar. The second scroll is vellum with archaic script and phrasing, but the red, red ink remains somehow wet. Of a binding a symptom, no vial can contain you. One of three separate, separated in prevention. Unbound but caged, I must not follow. Truth will hold you, whatever, for that is what truth does. The second scroll ends with a crude map and a handprint in red, the little finger sever severed at the first knuckle. God, why can't I... Blech. The Origin Scrolls, Second Aspect. Two scrolls. The first is a letter bearing the seal of a lesser or lesion noble house. Our line is dead but still walking. I know not if it is because of the old ways, but my three boys are now something other because of want. If he can be called on, I ask you, scholar, do so and the price is paid. The second scroll is vellum, with the archaic script and phrasing, but the red ink remains somehow wet. Of binding a symptom, no vial contain can contain you. Two of three threw yourself asunder. Caged, but still meddling, you will not goad me. Truth will hold you, or it is no longer true. The second scroll ends with a crude map, and a handprint in red, the little finger severed at the second knuckle. The Origin Scrolls, Third Aspect. The first scroll bears Ravani markings. He was our hero against Parvalin, and we were in awe. Perhaps it was our fault. There was a day when he changed and saw us as servants, not those he offered to serve. And then he was infested. We need a seal scholar in the faith you choose. The price is paid. The second scroll is vellum with archaic script and phrasing, but the red ink remains somehow wet. Of binding a symptom, no vial can contain you. Three of three, you perverted a man elevated by others. I will, not, I will not yield, even as I must turn to face you. Truth will hold you, or a new truth we will create. The second scroll ends with a crude map and a handprint in red, the little finger severed at the root. A torn note. A, note found, a torn note found in a conspirator's pocket. Will not tell you again, it's not safe to bring new recruits to our meetings. Meredith has eyes everywhere. Bring anyone who claims to be against her to Gardabal's warehouse at night. We must ensure their loyalty, lest Meredith discover us before we are ready to confront her. A crumpled note. Gamlin, I found the gem of Karashek. If you want it, come to Darktown, alone. Wallop Mallet. Gamlin. This gem is very pretty. I can understand your obsession with it. Remember the game Wallop? Find the place your find the place your Wallop mallet came from. Your answer is there. Your answers are there. Yeah. Bill of Lading. A note is crawled on the back of the bill. Bill of Lading, Smitty's Fish Guttery, Crate 1023. Gamlin. I'm sure you're losing patience by now, but what is one small trip to the warehouse district after waiting twenty years to get your hands on this gem? Find the crate noted on this bill. Enjoy your search. Capture Gamlin. Bring Gamlin to the caverns where we first met. If he's not alive, you won't get a single copper. Hmm. And that is that. <sighs> Oh, 
All right. I'm going to go back to recording episode 44. And I will see you in the next one. Take care of yourselves. Be safe. And uh, until the next one. Bye-bye.